Hold on to your butt. Come on, sucker. Let's get it on. Oh, you want to fight? You want to fight? I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. You don't know anybody named Iris? I don't know nobody named Iris. Can I have a piece of toast? I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Western demands. How could you do this to me? Blit, I want to know. Why did you do that? What you feel only matters to you. Step back for one minute and look at the big picture. And that's all. No, no, not for the real fire. The orphans bond a family that very few can understand. Help me. Help you. <laughs> I don't do drugs. Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I am your co-host Iris and I'm here with my older brother. Wesley, what's it to you? And today we are discussing a really obscure random Disney film from 1985. The Journey of Natty Gan. Random and obscure. I have no idea why you wanted to review The Journey of Natty Gan. You know, it tripped me out because I remember this movie growing up. I'm, I think you did. But I had to look it up to make sure because some of the promo stuff I saw in doing some research said exclusively on Disney Channel, which, by the way, has been around for a really long time, like a shockingly long time, even though we didn't really grow up with cable. I had to check to see if it actually got a theatrical release, which, of course, it did in September of 1985. Wow, when I was just five years old, and now this is available exclusively on Disney+. Plus. Inevitably, Disney+. Plus. Is this an obscure Disney flick? Well, it's certainly not well known. I feel like this came in a time when Disney was like, let's explore the darker side of childhood. And then they're like, yeah, let's not do that anymore. <laughs> That's not, this is the reign of Michael Eisner trying to go in weird directions <laughs> that the mouse didn't want to go in. This feels like something other than Disney. I mean, really, can you can you see the journey of Natty Gan being turned into a log ride at Disneyland? <laughs> like that would actually probably be a better log ride than <laughs> Splash Mountain at the moment. Be more action packed. But uh, there was no logs and there was no water in this movie, really. Well, there isn't in, uh, there's no logs and water in Song of the South. You don't know. You've never seen Song of the South. It hasn't been available for, like, ever. You're right. And they're You're redoing right. it anyway. They're ditching it in favor of the princess and the frog. You could turn it into a, uh, a Calico Mine like train ride at Disneyland. Yeah. When you say this movie is not really Disney type, it makes me think of like the movies that are supposed to be Disney friendly. It feels like a Disney movie to me, but I can see what you're saying. It's kind of like Anastasia. That was a weird Disney movie when, of course, it wasn't a Disney movie. And yet, strangely, Anastasia is now on Disney Plus, despite not being a Disney movie and being produced and animated by Don Bluth. I, I chose this movie because I realized that I had bought this movie on DVD at some point. What? And it, it migrated to Kelly's house where it now stands. And of course, when I saw it on Disney Plus, I was like, oh, that's one that I remember that I thought you would remember reviewing as a favorite, kind of in the same way as... Troop Beverly Hills, where I feel like it's not that obscure, because if we grew up with it, maybe other people grew up with it as well, except maybe you didn't grow up with it. And then I decided that it was kind of the anti Troop Beverly Hills, hmm. where it's nothing but dirt on her face. And despite receiving its only Academy Award nomination for Best Costuming, it's much more depression era toned down look as little like a girl or as like a lady as possible out in nature where i guess they were in true beverly hills but only to a limited extent <laughs> and in the same way that true beverly hills was meant to be contemporary i think that natty gan was meant to be more timeless they had the smoking which is very time specific like smoking in a disney movie that only happened in like the early to mid 80s uh right and then when it comes to controversial elements, they steered clear of a lot of that stuff. Natty Gan maybe doesn't court controversy, so it doesn't remain in the zeitgeist as something to attack in the way that we kind of came at uh, Troop Beverly Hills, bro, in the sense that they are they rely on stereotypes and and negative portrayals of certain peoples and things and it, where it might be off color for funny it doesn't age very well and i think natty gan has a safe 
timelessness because it's a time entirely separate from a the era in which it was made and b the era in which we're talking about it yeah so there's two eras right there's the 1930s depression era that the journey of natty gan depicts and then there's also like mid 80s atmosphere in in which this movie came out and like true beverly hills was released in 89 i mean 89 right like the end of the 80s so like height of consumerism and all of the things that made the 80s the 80s and it was aware of that and not maybe poking fun at it as much as maybe it could have or should have it didn't have enough distance to poke fun at it like we would now and like i'm wondering if when natty gang came out it was less um you know we weren't like fully what happened in 85? Like, when did, like, the 80s become the 80s? Not by 85, right? I mean, you say, when did the 80s become the 80s? For me, it's always the hallmarks are the movies. And 85 was the year of Back to the Future for me. And that was the beginning of movies for me. I know that we watched them, but I didn't begin to obsess about them until hmm. the 80s. Back to the Future is timeless in, it, in the sense that it feels like a contemporary movie, whereas Natty Gann feels old. It almost feels like... I know it's set in Depression era 1930s, but it almost feels like an old film. Really? So this is contradicting me saying that it felt timeless. You said you thought that it felt dated. I'm going to dispute that for a couple different reasons. Number one, I remember having a big crush on Meredith Salinger, who's obviously <laughs> a very pretty kid. But wow, is she a little kid like knowing that I was that she's older than me. And I had a crush on her when I saw this movie at all of nine, ten years old. Like, she looks painfully, disturbingly young in this movie. Uh, especially when she's kissing John Cusack. Oh, she looks as grossly inappropriate. Well, still, he looks like with his little baby-ass shadow. He was 18 years old in this movie, and he looks painfully young. And she was 14, which makes the kiss a, a little bit icky in retrospect. But it was also 80s Disney. Also considering she was playing 12, 14 playing 12. She was she playing 12? I think so. <laughs> so going back to that a little bit, it was weird to see her smoking and fighting and also making out when she was definitely underage as an actress playing the role of Natty Gann. But still, it was the 80s. It was a different time. But it didn't fall into the whole like she wasn't Swiss Family Robinson style pretending to be a boy. Right. Was there ever any sense that she was trying to pass as a boy to make her way through America to get from Chicago to Oregon? No, she was um, she didn't make any pretense about her gender or, you know, her presentation really at all. But that didn't help Brian. He was like, I really can't tell. Is 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 that person a boy or a girl? <laughs> OK, but the point is the movie didn't make a point about it either. It wasn't like, what are you, a girl? What are you doing out here? Like like Stranger Things 11 style. Even after she was clearly a girl and took her hat off and stuff, it was always like, get out of here, kid. You know, it was just the great equalizer of the Great Depression where everybody is either flourishing business wise or is an urchin trying to leech. And hobos are hobos, and thieves are thieves, and cattle rustlers are cattle rustlers. <laughs> and orphans are orphans? I guess. But the Dana, <laughs> and she's apparently done orphan roles before. Meredith Salinger has said this is her favorite type of role, this dirt on her face orphan type, where she's like hard scrabble ragamuffin. But she's not actually an orphan. I mean, maybe she ran, she was running with the orphans, but she was on the way to find her dad. Well, she was treated like an orphan, right? Because she didn't have any proof of her guardianship or her dad's guardianship. Yeah, sure, kid. Get in there in that girl's home or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, and I'm guessing because that was a problem then, where kids were abandoned because parents simply couldn't take care of them. So was Natty's abandonment, and of course her dad is a good dude and doesn't want to just ditch her, but he also is victim to his own devices, which was to let his kid roam free and roam wild. So all of a sudden when he needs her in the middle of the day, when she's out and about in Chicago in the 30s, you know, it's not like she could he could text her or be like, Natty, and she'd hear him across the city. She was doing <laughs> things, and you weren't going to see her until supper time. So if he has to get on a bus or whatever, a little bit questionable in his motives, but we weren't around around in 1930s era Chicago. So yeah. he goes because he kind of has to, but he feels bad about it, I guess. So was her being abandoned, was that the reason for the puppy and the fact that we brought the puppy into the thing to be all cute and innocent only to have her then abandon the puppy and, uh, <laughs> and go on her journey so that she can be, like metaphorically, she could be supplanted, the, the little innocent ab abandoned puppy and then be supplanted by the wolf yeah. or discover the wolf in her? 
Well, the puppy is definitely intended to establish her rapport with animals and her... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I guess. But, I mean, she was its protector and then abandoned it in an alley and... I get thematically. No, what no, no. Th- it wasn't an alley. He t- She tied the puppy to Sherman's cart so that Sherman, who apparently has a history of taking on her strays, could take care of the puppy. I, I didn't get that. So she tied it to Scatman Crothers' cart and left. I seriously thought she left him outside a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> which <laughs> no, that's where. Bad. <laughs> that would have definitely been worse. And that probably would hurt her credibility with animals. But back to this abandonment issue, like regardless of Saul, her dad's motivations for leaving her, she was abandoned, like in a neutral sense of the term. She was left to figure things out, even if it was only intended to be a temporary amount of time. And it's hard to really know what Natty's context is. We don't really get a sense of how long maybe her mom was, you know, was deceased or, you know, if she was ever kind of a latchkey kid. But it didn't really seem like Saul had a lot of options with Natty, right? Does he lock her up and make her a latchkey kid? Or does he let her out and about to gain some street knowledge and street smarts like he that's the best probably that he could do this is right i mean this has been going on for a long time the tom hanks set the precedence in news of the world where the kids roam free and you're only tangentially worried about them even though i would argue there's more crime and rape and creepiness in the 1800s or in 1930 chicago than there is now uh yes and yet we're more but we're even more protective of kids and they have even shorter leashes than they did in either of those two times yeah and sometimes literally leashes yeah that's a weird phenomenon too news of the world is an interesting reference and maybe we should release these two together because these movies news of the world and the journey of natty gan are both um they're not fantasies but they have happy endings and they have happy endings that you definitely expect Um, But they're also very episodically structured. Like, if you thought things were hard back in the Wild West, like, they were pretty hard in Depression-era America. Like, she just goes from one tragic, horrible event to the next, Natty Gan. Yeah, I mean, it felt episodic yet in that way. Um, There was a weird middle part where I didn't care as much, and maybe that was because of the transitory nature of these characters. It was very on the road, and that people come, it's it's very news of the world, where people come into your life, and then they disappear because you keep moving, and you move through their space and time. But I didn't care about the urchins. I didn't care about the home. It was all tangential, and it seemed like that girl wanted to be her friend or whatever. Natty wasn't interested in being friends. Even the wolf was transitory. Like, the wolf took off just in time for Natty to be reunited with her dad, because you can't have the complication of the wild animal when she's going to be reunited with her family which is the whole point same thing with harry like it was hard to care because these characters you figured weren't going to last and even the two main ones harry and the wolf didn't last maybe that ties into what you're saying i'm not sure well tom hanks and helena so-and-so certainly right off into the sunset in news of the world and we have nothing really to go on with i mean and in journey of natty gan world Like, as long as dad and daughter are together, all is right in the world. I mean, what was the condition, though, of his job thing? There's a bus, there's a ticket. Hey, don't punch my bus, if that was a bus, which looked like a weird ambulance or something. (laughs) But he couldn't. I mean, at the time, he wanted to get a hold of her. You mind, Connie, I'll send for you as soon as I can. Or you stay with Scabbin Crothers or something. But at the, even if she had been home and he'd rushed home and said, Natty, Natty, I got to go. I got a job. See ya. What would have changed? She would have stayed put until he had been able to send for her, uh, you know, a cross-country train ticket, which was, what, 10 bucks or probably 20 bucks from Chicago. Maybe the only thing is she wouldn't have. No, she got home and was like, hey, message from your dad. And she embarked on a course on her own. Your question is, how would the movie be different if they actually got to see each other before he left? Would he have abandoned her less in your eyes? Would it have been less of an abandonment if he had gone home and she had been waiting there? And he said, Nanny, I got a job. And she's like, that's great. It's on the West Coast. Uh, I'm going to go. Can you hang out for a few weeks? Something like that. <laughs> Well, I think to answer my own question, then I don't think the movie would have been that different because she probably would have had a falling out with Connie anyway. She didn't have the choice to stay at that place, right? She kind of had to go on the run. And if she's going to run, why not go in the direction of dad? Would it have been less of an abandonment? I think so, because there was a real risk that Saul was taking that she, for whatever reason, wouldn't receive his note. And it really didn't help that Saul's note was so, I guess he 
you know, had to kind of dash it off, but it was so uh, obscure. Like he could have been like, by this time, like such and such, or I know it's this logging company, like given her something to go off of. He gave her nothing to go off of. And it didn't help her in her journey. I think that the movie sufficiently set up that Saul didn't have a choice. And that in this time, he did what Natty would have wanted him to do. And it was just unfortunate that they didn't get a chance to say goodbye in person. It's hard to criticize the choices because in Depression Era Chicago, we don't know how people act. It seemed like it was reasonable and that certainly he cared about her, was worried about her, was true to his word, sent her the ticket. It's father and daughter's faith in one another that keeps this movie together. And it was pretty, like their relationship was pretty well set up, even though we didn't have a lot of time with them together. It's Natty's faith in her dad that propels her, that compels her across the country. And it's Saul's faith in his daughter that allows him to maintain hope. That she's not buried under a train? Uh, that's what I was going to say, but he kind of goes a little Twin Peaks and sits on top of trees and goes crazy a little bit. Well, I mean, I guess he is all about the extra pay and he had nothing to lose. It's true. In that respect, too, that kind of what stuck out to me. I think you go from Chicago in the 30s, which is really expensive. Then you can just go out into the trees and the mountains uh, as the backdrop for her adventures. And it looks gorgeous. And I think the cinematographer did a great job. I think that it felt expansive to me as a little kid. Natty was thrust out of her element and into the wide world of nature. And I felt that. And all the trees stuff was really great. And I think this movie stands out, too, from a technical standpoint, not just for the costumes, which were immersive to me, but the green screen. They did a really good job. Ray Wise, great character actor for many decades, was not at the top of that big tree. He was on top of a stump where he climbed and sat up there. And the green screen looked better than Temple Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, which was a year after this and was Spielberg and wasn't a little obscure Disney movie. This movie doesn't feel dated to me because it doesn't feel fake. Thematically, it's evocative mm. of an 80s style and a time where movies were innocent, even when they were trying to be hard scrabble and gritty. <laughs> um, but it looked good. It looks good. It's staged it appropriately like a Disney movie. It's almost a Disney nature film. It does look great. And the top of the tree stump shot was so believable that I didn't I didn't even question it. Maybe I was immersed enough in the story that I kind of accepted it. But it's hard to look at a film like this, knowing what I know about the actors and knowing what I know about the time, to really be fully immersed in it because I can't look at Ray Weiss and not think about Twin Peaks. I mean, is Leland Palmer, he's a, v a really terrifying character. And it's hard to look at Meredith Salinger and not think about Patton Oswalt. And that makes me think about his wife who passed. That's not her fault. Um, Stop projecting on Natty. It's hard enough. <laughs> you know, these, ca these characters after 35 years, you know, come with some baggage even if they're not super, super active these days. But I think there's something else that kept me out of this movie. And you said that it was very believable. Is that what you said? I think it was believable for what it was. Disney set out to achieve a thing, and I, th I think they did that. But I think what makes this movie Disney is how they romanticize this journey. Yeah, it's supposed to be kind of gritty and scary things happen along the way, but like her journey is awfully romanticized. I mean, Natty's never really in peril, and she's never really that dirty. I mean, John Cusack is like the cleanest hobo I've ever, the cleanest, most <laughs> handsome hobo I've ever seen. Yeah. Natty was like, I'm okay with dirt on me. And John Cusack was like, no, 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 we're not going to obscure these, these boyish good looks. Yeah, he's like pristine and he's like glowing. He's literally like glowing. And um, yeah, I guess what just makes this Disney is just how romanticized the hobo life is. Like she goes from place to place and she's eating out of trash cans and stuff. But there's never any there's never any real peril. There's never any real stakes for her. Um, uh, you, you know, she's just she's going to she's going to get out of it. And she's got Wolfie by her side. Dude, she almost got raped, and she had to jump out of a moving vehicle. What do you think that dude was going to do? Take her home and snuggle her to death? Oh, that guy was so creepy. Ew. And, and that's the closest we got to the real stuff. I don't know. It's just a guy who's going to take her home, and you're going to be my daughter. What do you think at 10 years old? 
I guess Natty was meant to be more worldly at 12 or 14 or however old she was supposed to be playing. But even as kids, we knew that that dude was bad. It's just as adults, we obviously know that she's not going to go down this rapey, sexually enslaved (laughs) kind of avenue. But I think that I think it was a movie for kids. I didn't think it meant to stand up there with Dances with Wolves as the uh, that would come, you know, a half a decade later with the wolf howling on the ridge. Or, uh, you know, the epics or her scrambling up the mountain where I wrote down that it was like the last of the Natigans. <laughs> wow. The last of the Natigans. Amazing. You spell that with the G, right? Natigans? Yeah. yeah. It was sweeping and it was an adventure tale <laughs> and... And we knew that the dog was going to make it, right? Not going to make it. Even though Harry maintained that he was never going to make it like seven times, we knew the dog was going to make it. Well, you got to set up his button where he's like, he made it, which was so perfectly, patently John Cusack. But I have a question for you. Okay. Is The Journey of Natty Gan, like it seems like an obvious coming of age movie, but is it? Like, she doesn't really realize anything new about the world or herself or her family. Like, it's not a coming-of-age movie, nor is it a Loss of Innocence movie. It's just like a story about a young girl who goes from A to B and has adventures along the way. The adventures of Natty Gann. Is it a coming-of-age movie? It's a test movie. It's an endurance. It's a man versus nature, man versus man, girl versus creepy man movie. Girl versus world. Girl versus distance. Not to compare her in any way to animals, which is dumb, but it made me think of The Incredible Journey these animals are placed in in a situation where they have to cross a great distance against the odds and they do it it's like the good dinosaur which ironically was not a good dinosaur movie you're you're it's a young person or a young thing was placed in a a situation where they have to get back home and they have to rely not not in a coming of age way but of the knowledge and the street wiseness and the determination that they already have to see it's a test of metal to get through. Okay, so if this is a girl against distance movie and it's a test of faith movie, then she never really has a crisis of faith. That would have been the obvious obstacle. Well, where she breaks down and believes she can't make it and almost decides to go with Harry instead of continuing on pursuing, you know, to find her dad. Yeah, or believes for whatever reason what other people say about her dad. That he doesn't really care and she's just another orphan. I guess that movie had these opportunities and that would have been, in my opinion, a better use of the time than the little tramp squad she gets thrown in with and the cattle rustling. That was more newsies to me than anything else in this movie and kind of forgettable. Yeah, where did they get that truck? I don't know. We were trying to keep it light touch. When she's reunited with Harry in the hobo encampment. Yeah, yeah, where she eats the beans. Yeah. Kelly was like, that was the worst knife fight I've ever seen. Where there's two hobos <laughs> fighting with the knife. I mean, I guess for real serious movies, that could be compared to the horrible fist fight scene that everybody overlooks in The Godfather, where James Conn swishes that dude's face with a six inch gap. And everyone's like, it's the greatest movie ever. I mean, Natty Gann was aiming for a specific audience and many, many things. I think it did really well. Not the least among them, the casting of Ray Wise as the dad and and, and Meredith Salinger as Natty were believable in that it was, it was schmaltzy, but it was a really good adventure movie when I was nine, ten years old. And now that you're 49? Jesus. I have to recognize it for what it is. It looks silly now to see, to think that John Cusack would have been king of the hobos. <laughs> and, you know, but they could have done things really differently. The wolf is like, woo, and the wolf is recalled to his nature and runs off to be with his brethren in nature, right? So Natty can realize her reuniting with her dad. And I fully, you know, the, I was like, he's going to look back. And he's going to look back when the, the wolf turns around and looks back at her. And she's got tears in her eyes and a sweeping score. But they didn't have the dog be like, oh, 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 you know, it because it could have gone that way. And it could have gone <laughs> much dumber and cheesier than it did. I did a wolf movie and was really hoping that the reuniting of wolf and girl would be moving, but it ended up being pretty stilted. That felt like the weird middle part of the movie where 
where Charlie is supposed to be the big scary blacksmith and all of a sudden he's got the wolf. <laughs> like, here, you wait here until your girl comes for you and then I'll let you out and you guys can have some fun. And so maybe in a way this movie was trying to subvert expectations. You know, the scary blacksmith who she figures she may have to do battle with in order to get her dog back or she might have to, you know, scald him with his own red hot poker and take her dog and run into the night ended up being the nice guy and the nice guy in the car, you know, wanted to cuddle her to death. And at least it wasn't across the board on paper, a safe, predictable movie, even if we knew what was going to happen. But it wasn't trying to subvert expectations to make any kind of message. It was just in service of the plot. Like Natty's not supposed to fear talking to professionals at the railway station. It's supposed to be a safe exchange and it ends up going the other way. You know, he ends up reporting her like by making the blacksmith scary looking and formidable and giving him a poker and stuff like that. It just serves to illustrate, to bolster Natty's courage and her tenacity that she's not going to let her dog go without a fight. She's bucking. She's bucking? Yeah. When Harry says, buck up, kid. And she gets, oh, yeah. she's all indignant. I'm bucking. Yeah. And people are like, oh, she said the F word. <laughs> she definitely, like if um, Marty had issues with people calling him a coward, she definitely had issues when people like question her ability to face reality at all. Like she was really prideful about that. What issue you got? What's your problem with Nat again? <sighs> that I'm in a bad mood? Man. Um, I mean, true Beverly Hills, for all of its insensitivities and failings, it was like super fun to watch. Like it was super delightful to watch. And Natty Gann was just kind of a slog. It's just like what terrible incident is going to befall Natty Gann next that she can rise above? Like I said, it, it was like a fat horse. It'll get you from A to B, but it belly kind of drags in the middle. But uh, <laughs> But it's all sweet lumps at the end, right? I'm sorry. Was I supposed to be like really nostalgic and all like moved by Nat again? Well, you never, I, I never was able to determine whether or not you saw or remembered this movie. You know, everything felt familiar about this movie, but I didn't remember anything specific about it. I mean, Kelly gets down on me for not being forgiving about certain movies. Like, I'm only reviewing them from an adult male perspective, and I'm not sure that that's always the case. Journey of Nat again, yes, I grew up with it. Yes, I have nostalgia for it. But I have to be able to view it as it is appropriate for kids. But I'm also older than Ray Wise was as the dad. And so there's only so much... There we go again. I think that Nat Nat again was fun for what it was. I think it was meant to be a family movie with a little bit of gusto and a little bit of guts for uh, a young lady trying to find her way in an obviously male-dominated world and just trying to get to her dad. I think it's a fine movie. It's like a forgotten movie and with a lost audience. Everyone's streaming Splash. Nobody's streaming The Journey of Natty Gann. <laughs> Is everyone streaming Splash? Well, just to see the fuzz butt. <laughs> I don't really know why or for what reason I would recommend Natty Gan. I also wouldn't feel comfortable watching it with Paloma. Has to be judged for the time that it was or no? No, it has to be judged in its lasting power. Boy, that's a misquote, but you know what I'm saying. Really? So Natty Gan, judged from a 2021 perspective... For you, see, I'm trying not to hang it all on sentimentality and nostalgia, but I feel it was effective and it was fun to watch. And while it dragged, maybe I'm just too old for that this movie, but it doesn't make it a bad movie. Does it make it an all right movie? It makes it an all right movie. Nat, the Journey of Natty Gann from 1985 gets an all right from West, and yet Tenet gets a nope. No, a whatever. I stand by it. Come at me, bro. That's our review on The Journey of Natty Gann, a movie from 1985, available exclusively on Disney+. Plus. It receives an all right from Wes and a nope from Iris. A what? Nope? I mean, a boring from Iris. Wow, boring. You just can't let Patton Oswalt be happy. Oh, <laughs> sorry, Patton Oswalt. And sorry, Meredith Salinger, because frankly, you did give a great performance. But um, what, what am I going to do? I got to come down one way or the other. Yep. 
818-835-0473 or whatever movies at gmail.com at or whatever movies on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for joining us in Iris's Great Depression. <sighs> Come at her, bro, because she's coming for your childhood favorites. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.